I'm going to introduce our next title sponsor, and that's Microsoft. We're very fortunate to have uh, Microsoft here in British Columbia. We've got two offices in Vancouver, Microsoft providing high-paying, rewarding jobs supporting BC families. We have, uh, we're very thrilled to have signed a memorandum of understanding uh, with Washington to create a Cascadia corridor. It's going to encourage meaningful and results-driven innovation between our two areas. It's going to help grow our technology industries across borders. And we talked about cross borders. It's about inviting the world to BC. It's about creating and strengthening job creation. It's about global enhancing global competitiveness. I'm honored to introduce our next speaker is Microsoft's Corporate Vice President, Julia White. Julia leads marketing and product development, uh, product management for Microsoft Azure security products, as well as their national cloud and data center marketing. She's a 16-year veteran. You know, when we hear veteran, we think of grizzled and battle scars, and I imagine she has those. But she joined the company as a product manager and moved her way up uh, to that position. Uh, from Julia, from there, Julia moved into different roles, uh, leading departments, leading teams of business channel marketing and sales, and played an integral part of Exchange Online. Do you remember that Exchange Online a number of years ago? It was one of Microsoft's earliest and most successful public cloud workloads. Julia provided product management and technical marketing for Office 365 and helped publicly launch Office for iPads app in 2014. She wholeheartedly embraces change, unafraid of challenging conventional thinking and standing out from the crowd. Whether her determination comes from being taught how to run a family business from the family dinner table as a child, or her training as an Olympic hopeful synchronized swimmer, or from earning her MBA from Harvard Business School at a time when very few others were willing to leave Silicon Valley. Joy is passionate about technology and ensuring Microsoft remains forward-looking. Without further ado, please welcome Julia White. Microsoft Cloud allows us to access information from anywhere. And Microsoft Cloud allows us to scale up. Microsoft Cloud changes our world dramatically. It wasn't too long ago, it would take two weeks to sequence and analyze a genome. Now, we can do 100 per day. With the Microsoft Cloud, we don't have to build server rooms, we have instant scale. The Microsoft Cloud is helping us to rebuild and reinterpret our business. This cloud helps transform business. This is the Microsoft Cloud. Thank you. Thank you so much. Knocked, no. Great Thank to be you. here. Thank you. Absolutely. Fantastic to be here. Good morning. I'm thrilled to spend a little bit of time with you this morning talking about how technology is empowering people and organizations across the globe. And obviously there's a lot in that. And uh, as I mentioned, I've been in technology for quite a while. And I like to say, you know, I started in the cloud long before it was cool. And my, actually my first job out of Stanford was doing Quicken online banking. And if you can believe it, back then, no one was willing to bank on the internet. That's where, how early days we were, the predecessor of the cloud. But from there, I had the opportunity to go from having Exchange Online, putting our very, very first mailbox in the cloud, to what became Office 365. And then more recently, moved over to lead our Azure business, putting the entire infrastructure business into the cloud. And it has been an amazing and awe-inspiring experience, and certainly humbling, and a lot of lessons along the way as well. But as I step back and think about, we talk about in this industry, transformation and disruption, like it's just the first time it's happened. So I want to put a little bit of historical context to it, because it's certainly not the first time and won't be the last. If you think back to you know, revolution from the steam engine, completely transformed what the, the transportation industry looked like, opened up new horizons. Electricity, we can now suddenly work and play 24-7. We didn't have to have candles and uh, go to bed when it got dark. We could fundamentally change how everything worked. Many of us, myself included, lived, have lived through the electronic and IT revolution. I mean, Microsoft was founded on the idea of a PC on every desktop with, when that was just 30 plus years ago. That was considered revolutionary and now it seems almost archaic in the idea of that. And the next, the fourth industrial revolution we like to talk about is the digital transformation. 
And this is fundamentally how every business, every organization is moving to a digital business. And we recently had Jeffrey Amlet from GE, CEO of GE, come on and talk about how GE is now a digital business. Um, lots more examples of that, but there's so much potential in what we're doing in this area. But I want to step back for just a second on that electricity, because I think it's a good analogy of back, you know, in the beginning of electricity, in, individual farms, individual factories had a water wheel to produce electricity or had a windmill to produce electricity, and that was the efficient approach to go. But then over time, we realized there's this incredible economies of scale and, and this standardization across, and we could offer this as an overall utility. And there's two big transformations that happened. First, the advent of electricity in general, we could go and work and, and play and do things that changed our lives. But then the switch from being independent up into having a consolidated holistic system. And I actually think this is analogy is quite similar to the cloud and individual companies having their own data center today. But the prospect and the promise that a global cloud infrastructure can provide and the innovation it can unlock to me, that is incredibly exciting. And we're just in the beginnings. I know the cloud is everywhere, and the cloud is big, and people are talking about it. But actually, we're still so early in the potential that it has in that area. And certainly, with this comes change. If you were the candle maker before electricity, after electricity, you go from being a necessity to being a novelty. And you had to adjust and adapt to that. But that's where innovation comes. And it creates so much new innovation and jobs around it. So as we move forward, it doesn't, shouldn't be as a surprise if you think about what's top of mind for CEOs in this time of digital transformation. And I can't tell you how much I talk to different customers around the globe, and this, they say it in different words and say it in different ways, but fundamentally it's about this fourth industrial revolution of that digital transformation. And if you look from a CEO perspective, 86% consider digital their number one priority. Um, and, and even looking across different factors happening from globalization, urbanization, other things, climate change, it's about that technology shift. And to me, this is why I love being in this industry, because it's always in the place of breaking through and making the impossible possible. And that's why and, uh, events like this are great to bring us together and talk about what those possibilities can be and how we move all of us forward in that way. And this transformation is really relevant to everybody across all different industries. There isn't one kind of place that we can't see this type of transformation. I was actually just last week in Washington, D.C., talking with a company doing research around MRIs and using the ability to do table-side analysis and, uh, and rendering and then using the cloud to do massive processing such that they were actually shortening the time that kids had to be in the MRI and getting much better imaging out of it. Great patient care, better outcomes, lower costs. Just one example. Public safety, another one very topical, particularly in the US, for better or worse. Things like IoT, when, when police draw their guns and IoT device signals, they know what's happening. Body cameras, we now have a system working on Azure with streaming body cameras so you can actually see what's happening real time in these frontline officers to make sure things are going all right. Lots of different opportunities there. And then certainly into IoT and what is it? it's enabling with the device connected to the cloud. Think about oil and gas and, and refining and mining. And we'll actually hear a little more about that today, of how you can do things so differently with that kind of sensor information coming off real time, understanding environmental impacts, understanding cost and manage that, understanding safety and health around something that in, in historical senses could be quite dangerous. So each industry, these are just a few examples, has this opportunity. And the, kind of the thread that weaves through all of these is the new data we have. So much information. You know, back when I started in technology, data was scarce. And power sat with data. That has completely changed. It's now open, widely accessible. So now it's about the insights. We all have the data. It's about getting that insights. And things like AI are truly possible because of the richness and the robustness of the data and the compute power of the cloud. And so as we head forward into kind of the AI capabilities in a very mainstream way, it's now possible. The things we've been dreaming about for years as technologists now on the cusp. And when we talk about digital transformation, they tend to cluster in groups. And ultimately, digital transformation takes all of these shapes collectively. But I thought I'd break it down a little bit in how we think about digital transformation. The one you probably hear about most or see examples of is around engaging customers in new ways. 
Now we can put your entire company experience in your customer's pocket. That's very different than it was just a few years back. So thinking about how do you create these robust experiences. One of my favorite customers I worked with is Real Madrid, the football company. And they have this interesting thing that their customers are 450 million fans around the globe. But only so many fit in a stadium. So how do they create this experience that's rich and personalized and relevant to all of their fans, even though they're watching from all over the world, and working with them on this incredible customer engagement experience that they developed, which is revolutionary in the football area. Certainly empowering employees, making sure that we're productive and satisfied and engaged. The productivity around employee engagement changed dramatically. And there's lots of stats showing that engagement and output are very directly tied. So how do we create experiences that are rich, that are possible, the technology gets out of the way for the business to run and bridging those areas? Certainly a lot of opportunity in optimizing operations, whether that be using IoT devices and mining, connecting cars, other technologies where you can just run more efficient systems. And in this case, also just take advantage of the economies of scale that the cloud offers, even if it's just continuing to maintain your existing systems. And then transforming products. How you go from being a traditional manufacturing company to being a digital company, fundamentally at the core of what you do. So I want to give an example of that transformation, uh, transforming product. One of my favorites, a great customer of ours, Rolls-Royce, the airline engine manufacturer, traditional industry. And they called us a while back now, and they were in trouble. They were about to lose one of their big customers, an airline provider, an airline carrier. And they're like, we need to innovate. We need to do something different. We're not being as competitive. So we worked with them. We went in, we saw what they had from the data perspective, what insights they had, how they were running their systems, what kind of customer engagement they had. And we built a completely transformative system that fundamentally has allowed Rolls-Royce to go from selling engines to selling engine hours as a service. Huge shift. They have a different business model now. They have different customer engagement now. I'll just show you a little bit of what we built. So first, a global dashboard so they can see every system across the globe. Every airplane that has a Rolls-Royce engine in it, they need to know where it is. If they're the engine, the service provider for those engines, they need to know where they are. They need to know what's going on. They need to have instant notification if, in this case, a fuel pump looks like it's failing in one of the planes in Frankfurt. Having that at that operations room, command center, so they can see exactly what's happening. But then they can also drill in using IoT and machine learning, looking and seeing specifically on that engine. What's the utilization? What altitude has been flying? What, air, what pilot's been flying it? Because there's differences, deep insights. So it's not just predictive maintenance. It's actual real maintenance based on the different attributes going on around that, air, that, that specific airplane and that engine so they can do the right kind of servicing. Obviously, with planes, the two first things I have is the, a dangerous situation or a delayed situation. So these are very material in real time and critical systems. But then it's about how do you put it into your frontline system. So all the insights are great, but if you don't change your business, it doesn't matter. So working with Rolls-Royce connected it right down to their field service system. So once they see that fuel pump, they figure out that that plane is on the ground and ready for maintenance, they can make sure they have the right person, the right part, and they're scheduling that replacement on time. Down to that assignment that the agent gets on their mobile app on the ground to go fix that fuel pump. Just an interesting example of how the technology and taking information they had, but putting it forth in a different way, allowed them to fundamentally digitize their business and going from a manufacturing company to a service provider. Incredible opportunity for them. Now, uh, rather than talk about other customers, I thought we'd bring it home a little more local. So I'm actually going to invite Goldcorp up. But before that, I'm going to play a video so you get a chance to learn a bit more about the company. But we know, think about maybe the original industry of mining gold and how does technology revolutionize that. So we'll go ahead and roll the video and then I'll, I'll bring them up. At Gold Corp, we're at the cutting edge of leading producers for gold mining companies. We're always trying to take the best avenue we can to make the most efficient and safe product. We work in a very complex industry with a lot of information. We're looking at new ways to innovate and to bring technology into the workforce. 
What I envision for the Mine Control Centre is to have the geologists, the engineers and the dispatch operators working together in a central area where all the information can be integrated through the HoloLens. The Mine Control Centre is going to allow everyone that needs to contribute to this concerted effort and be able to see exactly what's going to move where and how it's going to happen. The team is able to pull in the drill map and see the next blast set up and see where the ore blocks are located in the dig map and then understand where the priorities are to separate the ore and waste. The HoloLens is going to enable communication between the mine control centre and the operator so that the operator will know exactly when it's time to switch directions or to stop sending a certain type of material or when to completely stop digging. Doing so is going to enable us to send the right material to the right destination. And when you can do that, we're going to get a much better return on the material that we're mining. This is a powerful tool for mine management. The mine manager can put on a hollow lens and walk through the daily plan. The mine manager is able to pull in all the information and analyze what happened during the day and get answers to any questions they may have about the production plan. The Mine Control Centre can take what the mine manager was looking at and package up that plan that's been carried out for the day and it can be sent to any location in the world. Back at the corporate office, the executive is now able to review and understand the plan in a whole new way. The most exciting part of this project is I can see some very tangible benefits and once we start using it, it's all going to come together and it's just going to blossom. The partnership with Microsoft HoloLens is going to improve communication, it's going to improve mining accuracy and really it's just a stepping stone at building the mine of the future. So please welcome Luis. Kenapare from Gold Corp, the Vice President of IT. Don't trip on your way up. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. Thanks, Julia. Yeah. Now, uh, by the way, that was the first time we've showed anyone that concept video. It's early work that's piloting, doing on at uh, Gold Corp. So thank you for letting us share that uh, innovative oh. technology that it's you're doing on that front. So I just want to, you know, we, we should show the hollow. So let's talk about augmented reality a little bit. And you're, I know your early concept and you're exploring the opportunity. So tell me a little bit about how you're thinking about applying that to mining, kind of the, in, in, the uh, original industry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Julius, you can imagine, I mean, mining is we're still a bit backwards, right? I mean, we, we just started our digital transformation. And uh, as an industry, we're a bit behind everybody else, right? I mean, uh, oil and gas and uh, uh, financial services, everybody else have taken a leap forward in embracing technology, and we're just a step behind, right? I mean, the, the, but this is our opportunity to leapfrog and uh, embrace some of these technologies and make them uh, our own. And uh, I ambition of mine, the first time I went down to Redmond, our account team took us to, uh, to see the demo center, and uh, I remember being down and looking at Mars. You had your, uh, your uh, the HoloLens. Uh, the HoloLens is with the, um, I brought uh, Gil Lawson with me, our, our head geologist, and uh, uh, we're looking, and, and Gil just turned around and said, like, imagine if we could have our stopes, our new, develop our new mine developments being virtualized, and now a geologist in uh, Quebec could be looking at our mine in, Sarah, in Argentina, mm -hmm. or, uh, or uh, uh, from Vancouver, being, uh, being uh, transporting yourself to any of our mines in a safe manner. Right. You know, we keep talking about reducing cost of operations, but I'm also very excited about this because it's a way to take people out of harm's way. Mm. So, I mean, mining is still a dangerous industry, right? I mean, we still have people working underground. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more we can use this technology to make people safe and work from, uh, from uh, remote locations where, where you don't have to expose yourself to uh, uh, um, right. uh, mining hazards, it will be a, a much better. Absolutely. Imagine using drones and hollow, and so they can Absolutely. be in the mine without being in the mine. Yeah, no, and, and economically, imagine if we could develop areas of the mine that you will not traditionally do because they're mm -hmm. dangerous or mm -hmm. they're unstable and you can't, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're not putting people at risk, you could actually develop these areas and uh, make, more, make your mines more profitable. Absolutely. Now earlier we were talking about, you might not know, but in mining, gold particularly, the hit rate's quite low. It's like less than 1%. <laughs> so it's an expensive endeavor to go and look and find the right places. So I was interested in how you're, talked about data, how you're using artificial intelligence and how you're thinking about using this new capability to help improve those rates. Absolutely. Well, uh, exploration is probably one of the areas that I believe is more ripe for a, for a change. Mm. Uh, traditionally, we're, I mean, mining in general is very hard to, I mean, 
identifying a new ore body is very difficult, and not only to, uh, to identify it, but also to develop. Mm -hmm. um, ore bodies are deeper and deeper in the ground, and uh, it's a lot more complex. They are not continuous. You have to do different uh, mining methods to, uh, to, uh, um, to extract them, and uh, they're becoming more, uh, more cost ineffective, right? So uh, one, one of the things that we're evaluating is we're looking at artificial intelligence as a way to take all our exploration data mm -hmm. and uh, using these AIs to identify patterns that humans can, uh, can find. Right. And uh, we're hoping that if we can, uh, number one, if we can make all this data structured, because mm. again, we have balls full of data that are in right. paper. Uh, if we can digitalize all of these, make it, mm. make it available to, uh, um, to our geologists and uh, somehow structure it and make it more consumable, yep. I believe our ratio of exploration will, uh, our, our success of exploration will improve significantly. All right, and then last area around the cloud. You know, despite being in what you're calling yourself a laggard industry, but you've been using the cloud for a while, so interested in how that's helped you and, and what ways it's impacted your business. Well, I was your first client in BC. I was the first one to embrace Office 365. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're the first company to move, but uh, um, we are certainly looking into it. And uh, I, am, I have this vision of a mine that doesn't require servers, mm. that uh, we can move all of our technology outside of, uh, of the mine and uh, yep. uh, basically operate from the cloud. I mean, uh, we operate in very remote locations, and uh, sometimes to maintain these systems is very expensive for us. Right. So uh, the cloud could be a, a significant player. We have to figure out how we get some of these operating technologies and uh, IoT outside. The ones are real time. How we get them outside of the uh, outside of the mine in a, in a, with latency issues. But uh, once we sort that out, I believe that we'll be one of the first companies to fully embrace cloud and. So end, and, to end, uh, end to end, yes. Now you're using it for your employees and then helping your employees connect in a better way. Absolutely, we have. Uh, we're. Uh, uh, a lot of our systems are already running on the cloud, and, uh, and uh, a lot of our, we're even looking at moving our ERP into the cloud as well in the, in the following years. Uh, but I have the dream of making that first mine yep. that is 100% cloud. It's fantastic. So. And you're on the cutting edge of your industry in that front. So <laughs> thank you so much for sharing thank some you of it. your stories and experiences you've had. Appreciate Pleasure. it. Absolutely. Now, so where does Microsoft fit in this, in this overall digital transformation? So I just wanted to step back for just a second and ground on our mission. And Microsoft is very much a values-based company. And at our core is this mission of empowering every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. So all of our innovations, all of our investments, all our resources here and globally are about achieving that core mission. And particularly in the area that I focus on, so much of this is made possible and what we can do because of the cloud and what's happening in the cloud. So I want to talk a little bit about what does that mean? People talk about the cloud, what is it, what's part of it, and just how we're addressing it and have our point of view on what the cloud is possible to do or possible doing. So first of all, starting with productivity and then really getting after that employee experience, how do you create engagement, but also across the supply chain across partners in the B2B uh, area of how do you create great productivity experiences. And then as we think about into business applications, ERP, CRM, and historically productivity and business applications were very siloed. And what you did in your email or your IM or your chat was very different than your structured business processes. Well, we really believe these are kind of becoming more and more integrated. And even as we now, Microsoft recently acquired LinkedIn, new capabilities of bridging those experiences and insights of how to connect people more effectively across business and their personal life as well. Obviously, the core of so much of digital transformation is around application innovation. How do we invent that next incredible experience? How do we create that new application on HoloLens that gets people out of the mines and into more safe areas? Those kind of experiences, the whole spectrum. And that's really where our Azure Cloud Platform comes in to enable all different flavors of that. And as we talked about, data is the fuel of this digital transformation. So enabling artificial intelligence in a first-class way in a cloud model as well. And then, of course, nothing can be done without great security and management across those pieces. Now, customers and partners use different parts of the cloud based on their unique needs and any combination. And that's great. That's how it should be. There isn't an all, all or one or one size fits all in how this looks and what you need for your unique situation. But the thing I love about what Microsoft does is that we've, no matter what part of the cloud you use, no matter which technology problem you're trying to address, we deliver it in a holistic way. So they build on each other, they work together, the same security, management, privacy, those kind of things across. And the three core promises around global, trusted, and hybrid. So from a global perspective, we have data centers right here in Canada, but we also have them around the globe. We have 38 data center regions 
over 100 data centers across the globe. We have more distinct regions than our competitors combined in terms of the geographical um, footprint that we have. And we've done that very specifically. We put data centers in Canada first because we knew that would matter to businesses here as well as in many other countries. From a trusted perspective, yes, many years ago now when we were very first starting our journey to the cloud, I thought, man, for people to work with us and put their critical, mission critical applications in our cloud, they have to trust us. And so we set up principles in the beginning. The trust was made of compliance, privacy, security, and transparency. And that everything we do across our cloud would live up to those promises. And maybe my favorite example of what we are willing to do in this space is that we actually, in the, in the principle of privacy of our cloud technology, we sued our largest customer, the US government, because they were asking for information in the Dublin data center. And we felt that was not right. So we sued them. <laughs> and we won. Now you can clap. <laughs> what was it? Almost two years we went to court with the US government and we won that case. And that was incredibly important for Microsoft, but the industry, to make sure that privacy in this world is maintained and respected. And so much of this area is still gray. And we are committed to working on the front lines with the Canadian government as well as across the globe to make sure those standards are set and that we meet them. And then in hybrid, now people talk about what is hybrid cloud, what does that mean? And a lot of people say, you know, I call it hybrid washing. They talk about hybrid as a way to say, no, I still need my data center, it's super important. That's not how I think about it. Hybrid is about enabling every organization, no matter what existing infrastructure you have today, to take advantage of the cloud capabilities, to, do, to bridge this generational shift in a way that makes sense from a security, privacy, economic perspective. And that's why across all of our cloud services, we have a rich, consistent hybrid experience. So having on-premises technology and cloud technology can live compatibly without the complex and cost that it could be otherwise across our entire stack. So core, core investments in that area. But of course, the cloud is not just something by itself. It needs to be connected to people and information and devices. And that's where that connection comes from our cloud into the device world as well. And that's from everything from IoT, millions and millions and billions of IoT devices, to PCs, to phones, and then of course, into the HoloLens, which in our Microsoft Canada R&D Center doing work right here on the ground in this area, and it's such a fantastic market. I can't wait to see what this group of people in this uh, area of the world can innovate around augmented reality. Now, to kind of uh, make that a little bit more real, I wanted to um, first play a video, but I'm going to then invite uh, Mojio, who is a great new uh, innovative startup, to talk. But let me first roll their video to give you an introduction to who they are. Smart. Smart phones, smart watches, smart TVs, smart homes. We live in an increasingly smart and connected world. Yet more than a billion vehicles remain so incredibly unconnected. The automobile is the missing piece in a smarter, more connected world. But change is coming. Your smarter, more connected life is expanding to your car. Deutsche Telekom and Mojio have partnered together to give every vehicle a voice. By harnessing Deutsche Telekom's leading pan-European network to connect millions of vehicles with Mojio's cloud platform, we unlock hidden data that makes driving safer, more reliable, and less expensive. Through partnerships with manufacturers, service providers, and Internet of Things leaders, we are revolutionizing the automotive experience. Soon, our vehicles will communicate with each other, sharing real-time data to increase efficiency and help save lives. These digital conversations between vehicles, people, businesses, and cities will connect our world and drive it forward. Together, we are connecting the vehicles of today for the journeys of tomorrow. This is your car, only smarter. Fantastic. I'd like to introduce Keith Hawk to come join us, the CEO of Mojio. Kenny Hawk, I'm sorry. Kenny Hawk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Come on up. All right. Now, you, I know you just recently uh, released that video, and uh, just not too long ago, I uh, went into market. So give us a little bit about your journey that you've been on with your company. So Mojo, very Canadian. We're based here in Vancouver. Uh, started back in 2012. Can you hear me okay? No, I think you I don't think, think my microphone's on. Mm -hmm. 
try it. You'll have to speak really loud. <laughs> Maybe we can just get a, uh, a handheld up. A handheld mic? There we go. He's coming. Wouldn't be technology without a little glitch. <laughs> Da, da, da. Thank ah, you. Much better. So started in 2012, based here in Vancouver on House Street. Um, I took over a year and a half ago, and the company started as a B2C company, trying to uh, sell new technology for connected cars directly to consumers. That wasn't working. Uh, we shifted the business, uh, as most startups do, and to B2B2C model, uh, and very much focused on mobile carriers. And today, uh, happy to announce we launched uh, on schedule, on budget with T-Mobile nationwide in uh, November. Less than two weeks later, launched with Deutsche Telekom in Europe, and uh, we built all of that on top of uh, Microsoft Azure. And in the process, uh, we grew our team from about 15 people to 45 today, and we'll wow. be about 70 or 80 by the end of the year. Now, what I think is so particularly amazing about your story of going from kind of basically launching to going to a massive global system, uh, that's fairly daunting. So interested in, I'm sure people will be interested in, kind of what, what was that like and how did you have to think about that? Daunting or crazy? Maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> so think about a small growth company deciding to launch with T-Mobile, not just a few test stores, but launch nationwide, 4,000 locations, train 24,000 salespeople, mm. and oh, by the way, let's launch with another carrier less than two weeks later <laughs> in Europe. Uh, our investors thought we were crazy, and uh, we you, pulled it off. You might have been crazy, in fact. <laughs> the fact you pulled it off made you not crazy, though. Well, you know, when we launched, I have to say, we, uh, I mean, we had very optimistic uh, hopes, and those were blown away by T-Mobile. Uh, mm. We blew through our projections in the first couple days. Wow. Our system went down. Uh, very embarrassing to launch and have an outage in your first couple days. And we had to call in all the way up to the CEO of Microsoft mm -hmm. to come help us. We said, please, uh, we're going to shut down T-Mobile. We need help, we need an ASAP. Mm -hmm. And the next day, we had the A-team from Microsoft up there, Scott Guthrie, Mark Sims. Mark stayed there for three days, day and night, mm -hmm. almost slept at the office <laughs> to get us back up and running. <laughs> and uh, to, you know, for a, a growth company to have that kind of support from a giant like Microsoft, I mm -hmm. mean, to me, it was unbelievable. It's why I'm here today. That's to fantastic. personally say thank you for getting us back up and running. Absolutely, and thank you for your business. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but uh, and uh, just thinking about well, you know what caused that mind from being you know a, a little startup in some level to being a global industry obviously only possible because of the cloud technology obviously I mean an architect it in an efficient way but um, just think about your technology choices. Well, it was you know we had to decide what do we do and what do we do inside what's special and different and what should you differentiate on and what is just kind of context that you can buy the best from somebody else. And we decided, yeah. even though we're backed by Amazon, it's kind of crazy, Amazon's an investor and we're not built on Azure, but uh, what we needed, uh, the core was all in Azure. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was in, it, what we needed today is there, yeah. what we need in the future is in your roadmap. And so we decided to not reinvent the wheel, yeah. leverage off what you're already doing, and do only the special things that are gonna be differentiators for Mojo. Mm -hmm. And we also knew from the beginning, we're building a global company here. It's not a Vancouver company. We're based in Vancouver, but our customers are global. So right. to have that kind of scale uh, was also important in us, winning T-Mobile, winning Deutsche Telekom, winning the other carriers that we're, mm -hmm. we'll be announcing later this year. Um, so we can focus on what we do different. Absolutely, and one of the things we were talking about backstage is Microsoft and uh, Deutsche Telekom also run a, uh, what we call our German cloud, uh, Microsoft, that it's run in partnership with uh, Deutsche Telekom to offer another level of privacy for the German market, and uh, something we're both jointly working on, we discovered backstage, so lots of connections. In the German black forest, um, and it's really important to keep data in Europe, stays in, in Europe, data in North America, stays in North America, and we thought a lot about privacy, and you know, just to, if you're wondering what we do, um, you know, all the car companies are advertising connected car, be able to track your car, be able to find your car, be able to know what's going on with your car. But for the half a billion cars that are out there that are not connected, we want a very easy way to connect them. That's what we give the carriers, a very simple way yep. to connect up your car and put high-speed Wi-Fi in there. So when something is wrong with your car, instead of just getting an orange check engine light, we tell you what's wrong, how important it is, can you fix it later, do you need to fix it right away, how much you should pay for the repair. And eventually, insurance companies will give you a discount for having that in there. And in this very near future, you'll have a message at the end of a trip saying, you know, Julia, as you're driving down the highway, your car slipped around that corner. It's time for new tires. <laughs> for your car, BMW 525i, and based on how fast you drive and how wild you drive, we want you to get the performance <laughs> tire. It's in stock at the lowest price at this shop. Click here to have it installed, or we can come install it at your office. 
amazing. compared to waiting till you have a flat or a blowout on the highway. Right. So saving time, saving lives, and uh, improving teen drivers is what we're all about. That's fantastic. Now, you're in a very, I, I think, very exciting space in what's possible. And I do feel like it's, we're doing, setting, seeing incredible innovation, but it's still early. So what, you know, if you had to predict looking forward, what would the, the, a few things in the future might look like? Well, I think that in the past, we've had to take care of our cars. You know, something goes wrong, we have to take care of it. In the, in the future, I think our cars are going to take care of us. Yeah. They're going to let you know it's time to get new tires. Mm -hmm. They're going to find you a parking spot. They might even reserve one ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Instead of figuring out which of the three different reward systems you use when you go to the gas station, your gas is already paid for. You already mm -hmm. are getting your points, and you're finding the place that has the best price. Um, and then the other thing I think about, just as a, as a growth company, the biggest thing is talent and getting great talent. Totally. And to hear Premier Clark talk about the things that they're doing here in British Columbia and what Prime Minister Trudeau is doing for yep. innovation and the future, I love building a company here. Talent is the, the key, and getting great talent has just been awesome in Vancouver. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your story and for your Thank partnership. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. And I love it. It's a very real experience, but such to me, what's possible before the cloud, a small business like that would have had to build incredible infrastructure or make all kinds of uh, different partnership arrangements. So now they can just do that and overnight become a global success. And that to me is what, again, is so exciting about the technology space all up. So in transition, let's think about Microsoft in Canada specifically. If you're not aware, we have an incredible set of investments here locally and around the country. And just to highlight a few, but over 2,000 startups that are in our, Biz, our Canada BizSpark program. And this is, this is actually Mojio was part of one of our BizSpark startups, but an investment in technology and resources and expertise to help your startup grow and take advantage of technology in the best way possible. And of course, it's going to be unique. So they're going to be working hand in hand on what everything from that business model might look like to how you use the technology most effectively on that front. We obviously have a huge, thriving partner ecosystem, which is wonderful, with 12,000 partners across the country doing a range of things, whether it be augmented reality apps to helping people run their data centers more efficiently and work and transition to the cloud in that front. As I mentioned earlier, too, we also have two data centers here in Canada, an early investment we made several years ago, both in Toronto and in Quebec City, to make sure that if you wanted to run in the cloud in Canada and you wanted to make sure all your information stayed within Canada, we made that possible for you. And so something you can take advantage of, along with tapping into the overall global, uh, global infrastructure as well. And something I'm actually personally excited about is actually that Microsoft was, from a uh, diversity and inclusion perspective, we were rated number four as some of the best best places to work in Canada in the Microsoft Canada team. So fantastic work on that front as well. As Mayor Clark said, more, to, more work to be done in bringing more women into technology, but I love to see that progress we're making as a company, but also as part of the local ecosystem here as well. And we've had a long and, and fantastic relationship between Microsoft and the local Canadian government as well, and that's part of being here today. And a major investment we've made together, as uh, Premier Clark mentioned, the Cascadia Innovation Corridor, bringing the best of you know, Seattle's cloud city together with incredible innovation, particularly in augmented reality. And I was thrilled to see the new investment and tax uh, incentives they're making around continuing innovation in that area to kind of bring those two places together. Across our two cities, we have over 12 million citizens that we can help and drive more uh, social and economic viability for as well. And one of those key investments in establishing this innovation corridor was investments in the University of Washington, as well as in the University of BC to work together and collaborate, particularly on social and socioeconomic issues that face us collectively in that area. And again, so we're still early on this journey, and there's so much more potential in the partnership here overall, but I'm thrilled to see our two cities working hand in hand to drive greater innovation for our corridor, but ultimately for the world and all of the customers we serve around the globe. So with that, thank you very, very much for having me today and enjoy the rest of the conference.